it looks like oh that's almost eight we'll wait a minute and then it'll be eight um just so we know today what i plan to do is a few tips on homework um one problem number two um there's a few questions about homework one problem number one but um i'll just answer those individually uh, homework two is kind of a challenging one and there's a couple of little things that I'll go ahead and point out, or one thing in particular I'll go ahead and point out that should help you get further along on that. Um, and then we're going to look at power screws and lead screws. That's chapter 8.2, uh, a little bit of 8.1, I guess, also. Um, looks like it's at 8 o'clock, so let's go ahead. Um, problem 1 on, or, or well, on problem 2, homework 1, uh, is a double reduction gearbox. And so you get this thing that looks kind of like, uh, let's see, you've got a shaft in here. And there are uh, two bearings on it. Let's just mark in some bearings. I think one of them's kind of over here and then one at the end on the other end. And then there's two gears on it, a larger one over here and then a medium sized one we'll say over here and this is the um, the shaft that most of the stuff you, that you're analyzing is about but uh, you do have another shaft uh, the output shaft there's a gear over here that's um, relatively large Make it like this. This is going to be the output gear, uh, or well, the output shaft is going to be attached to this. So there's a shaft that comes out over here. There's a couple of bearings, all that. We're not going too concerned with it today. Um, there's a drive input gear over here somewhere. And it's connected to a motor. Um, so this guy, uh, a lot of stuff going on and there are I don't even know how many little questions about this there's I don't know 50 fill in the blank type things you got to do um, but to do them some of them are pretty obvious um, like figuring out the torque in the various locations you just use the gear they give you the get different numbers of teeth for each one of these gears um, you do have to remember that some of the things that you need you need the sizes of these gears so this is gear one gear two, gear three, and gear four. So you do need all of those um, different sizes. They only give you the size of gear one, but if you know the gear ratios of all of these things based on the size of gear one and the assumption, I don't remember if it's explicitly stated or not, but um, these gear do have the same pitch as these gears. So you can use the ratios of uh, gear teeth to figure out the size. So if you know the size and number of gear teeth on gear one, then you can figure out the uh, size of two, three, and four just based on uh, the ratio of their number of teeth to gear one's number of teeth. So that's one thing that you need to know. Um, and then it goes off into, there's, there's a lot of stress concentration factors you need to know. Those you, know, you just look up in the book. Um, it does give you some guidance. If you read carefully in the problem statement, it gives you some guidance on um, which ones to use the first iteration uh, guesses and things like that. Uh, that's relatively straightforward. And then um, you have to start figuring out the bending moment or so the moment that's causing bending in all at, you know, this. So you want to draw the shear and bending diagram. Um, and that's where most people start having a little bit of trouble. Uh, so we need to also look at, um, let's just look at the combination of gear one and gear two um, because Gear one is the input. Go ahead and put that down. And you do know how much torque is input. So for my problem, it's 50 foot pounds. For yours, it's some other number similar to that, but who knows what it actually is. Uh, but there is an input torque that you do know. Um, so you know that much. Um, and then you know a lot of, they give you a very detailed drawing of all of these, well, actually these two components, I guess, the the two shafts, the main shafts. Um, you have to know a couple of things about that, uh, that it does give you indications on, uh, maybe in the hints at the bottom or whatever, that the gear, uh, 
sets themselves are centered, like the force for whatever's going on at gear two uh, is going to be centered in its uh, shoulder or, well, in its uh, seat. Uh, and so you can, you'll have to do some, like this one, for instance, you're given that there's a distance from um, the edge of the gear. Basically, you're given the thickness of this gear two as W two, and so the force that's happening on W on gear two is going to be W two over two. So we're right in the middle of this gear. Um, so if you were looking at the force there, it'd be right in the middle. Um, finding those forces is a little tricky. Why don't we get a little closer? There we go. Um, so what you need to do is let's look at gear one and gear two just by themselves and figure out um, how you would go about figuring out the force on gear two. So if you look at the other diagrams associated with this picture, you'll see that um, gear one, the input gear is kind of maybe here. And then gear two is a bigger gear over here, something like this. And then um, I'll go ahead and draw it, but we're not going to worry with... Uh, actually, it's probably too confusing. It gets cluttered if I draw the others. But gear three, this little guy, uh, would be right here. And gear four would be over here somewhere. But I'm going to leave them off for now. Uh, you would need them to be able to put this thing in static equilibrium and to figure out what forces are going on at gear three. But uh, we're going to just look at this for right now. Um, it gives you a couple of other details, one of them that uh, you have an angle here and they show it uh, as an angle between the center lines of gear one and two and vertical. And they say that that angle is uh, alpha. Now I think all of the problems uh, are set up such that alpha and then you've got gear uh, three and four over here. Uh, labeled with a beta. I think alpha and beta is the same for everyone. So for me, alpha is 25 degrees, beta is 25 degrees. And I think that works out for everybody. You don't have 25 and 30. That doesn't change a whole lot, um, but it would, uh, it would just be a little bit different process, but I think everyone's alpha and beta are the same. <clears throat> okay. The other crucial piece of information that is uh, in the description of this thing is that the pressure angle for the gear teeth, so we're not drawing all, I guess I did kind of draw the teeth on, on this guy, uh, but um, the, the teeth here, so this is kind of like where the, the pitch line, where the gears actually make contact with one another is what this is showing, um, pitch diameter. But um, the pressure angle for whatever gear set you have is the same as uh, this angle alpha. And so for three and four, uh, the angle beta, which I believe for everyone is the same as alpha. So for me, alpha is 25 degrees, and I think it's actually 25 degrees for most of your problems also, uh, I believe. So what that does is it means that if I were to draw the contact force, so the resultant force between Let's, let's make these clear what they are. So gear one is here and gear two, I might have to get a little bit zoomed out. There we go. And gear two is this guy. So the pressure angle between these gears is the same as alpha, so 25 degrees. And what that means is that uh, remember, whenever two gears make contact with one another, or two spur gears anyway, you get a tangential force, the one that's creating the torque to turn the gear, and a radial force, one that's uh, from the point of contact directly inwards towards the center of the gear. Um, so if you take those two, treat them as components for a triangle, the resultant is the contact force, and that contact force is at the pressure angle. So for us, um, if we look at, I don't even know which way this gear is supposed to be turning. Uh, I think it's going, I think it's going this way. 
it you could figure out the right direction for it but right now I'm not too worried with that so here's the tangential force we'll just draw it over here so that would be the tangential force between gear one and two maybe just how you want to label that I have to zoom in to see all that okay um, the radial force would just start at this point and it would go straight towards the radius shouldn't have drew, drawn that blue line right there it's going to go right in there so maybe that's the radial force between one and two and the contact force is there resulting so the contact force is at so we're going to call fc let's write in black So FC, so FC between one and two would be the contact force between gears one and two. Um, that is going to be at the pressure angle. And the pressure angle is in the problem statement. Now this doesn't always happen, but in the problem statement, uh, it says that the pressure angle equals alpha so the same as where this gear is located from the vertical of the um, gear two and what that ends up doing in this scenario when you have the pressure angle between the gears equal to this spacing then uh, this resultant and you can work this out you could actually go calculate the components we'll show how to get this component because it's the one that you start with um, but what it does is it makes that pre resultant contact force perfectly horizontal so FC between 1 and 2 so that that contact force ends up being perfectly horizontal um, and that's convenient later on it doesn't have a Y component so if I if I treat this uh, gear as having an X axis and a Y axis or Z or whatever direction you want to call it I would call it X and Y um, X and Y then later on when I go back to this guy I can actually put X and Y components on gear 2 X and Y components on gear 3 um, instead of doing the radial and tangential components like the mm -hmm. example that we did on the very first day um, break them into X and Y and use those components and the contact force is going to be in the x axis and the 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 y component of our contact force is actually zero because it's perfectly horizontal so that saves you a little bit of problems when it goes to figuring out the shear and bending diagram for this shaft that we're going to treat like a beam with a support here and a support here and forces at g2 and forces at g3 so what you have to do here is let's say that my input torque is 50 foot pounds yours will be something different than that mine's 50 foot pounds um, then the number of teeth on gear one is um, well I don't know what my not on look it up let's just pick a number 10 10 teeth and let's just put 30 teeth over here so you're, you'll have some in your problem statement you'll have some numbers of the teeth uh, so I've got a 3 to 1 gear ratio with the numbers I just made up um, so what that means is that um, the torque that is going to be in uh, the shaft connecting uh, gear 2 and gear 3 all of that is going to be three times the amount of torque that we input so it's going to go three times slower this is why this is called a double reduction gearbox uh, because we're reducing the speed twice so we've reduced it once here and then again by whatever this ratio between gear four and gear three is so it's a double reduction so it's actually uh, multiplying torque multiple times uh, but it's reducing speed multiple times two times all right so um, i i would have 150 foot-pounds of torque here to get that 150 foot-pounds of torque 
the tangential force is going to create that and it has a radius distance of whatever this dis radial distance is. So remember torque is a force times, in this case, a radius. So the torque I need to generate is 150 foot-pounds. The force is this tangential component. And the radius is this radius, which you can get if you know uh, the, um, let's just say that this guy has a one inch radius, that's really small, but I'm sure yours are more like three or four or five inch radi uh, diameters here. So one inch radius, let's say. So this one would have a three inch radius. So the same ratio of uh, gear teeth is also the same ratio of sizes. So if I have a three to one ratio on number of teeth, then I have a three to one ratio on the size. So the uh, three inch radius. Now I do have issues here because I have inches and feet. So maybe convert over to um, inch pounds over here. So 150 foot pounds times 12 inches per foot equals the tangential component between one and two. So that force right there uh, times three inches. And I can solve for this guy. So once I know this one, then I can figure out the uh, just with trig. I guess I didn't label it on here, but remember that this angle, this is the pressure angle, 25 degrees. And if I know this component, I can figure out the, the, the um, contact force is the hypotenuse of this triangle. So this side would be the radial component. This side is the uh, tangential component creating the torque. Uh, and then this is the contact force. So to say it again, uh, what we did the first day is we used the tangential and radial components to create the shear and bending diagram. Um, in this case, it's you can still do that. Um, you can still figure out, you know, what this, these planes are and use those two. Uh, but in this case, it's much simpler just to use the X component, uh, which in this case is the resultant of these two. Um, and you'll get the same amount of deflection. Uh, you just only have to use one plane. You just have to figure out deflection in the X, Z plane. So it would go into the page or out of the page, whichever way you want to go. Um, so this should help you get a little bit further uh, along on the um, problem too. Uh, it's a lengthy one. I did extend the deadline a little bit uh, because it uh, everything's kind of uh, a little bit off. So uh, I gave it a few more days. I opened up homework two and homework three also, which are uh, much simpler than this one. One of them does have this problem again in it, but it's asking much simpler concepts. All right, so work on that some uh, and see if you can get any further. Um, if there's particular questions about this one again, then uh, we'll, we'll revisit it. But uh, this should get you a little bit further down the road. When you go to um, do gear three over here, then it's going to end up the same way, except it's uh, Comp uh, for contact force is going to be pointing horizontal in the opposite direction. And so it you can ignore the fact that this contact force is down here and the other contact force is going to be up here um, and just treat them as if they were at this, the center of the shaft when you go to draw your uh, shear and bending diagram. Your shear and bending diagram uh, is going to look something. We'll do a simple little mock-up here. Not the shear and bending diagram, but the uh, free body diagram to create the shear and bending diagram. Uh, you know, it'll do something like this. You'll have the, the contact force for one and two. You'll have a reaction at, uh, I don't remember what that bearing's called, B, I think. And then you'll have the contact force between three and four, and then the reaction at A. So you'll be solve, you'll solve for these two using this process. And then reaction A and B, you'll solve just as this thing as a beam with two unknowns on it. So summation of moments about B will get you A, and then summation of forces in Y will get you reactions at B. 
then you can draw your shear and bending diagram and you finally have the bending moments at these points that are creating some bending stress in the shaft. Long process, um, but that uh, should get you moving in the right direction on problem two. Um, all right, so for today, what we're going to do, we're going to look in a new chapter, chapter eight. So we're going to be over here, screws and fasteners. <clears throat> um, we're going to, so this whole chapter covers um, threaded pieces. So we're going to start with power screws, um, and then most of the rest of the chapter is going to be more what you think of, like normal boat bolts and things like that. You're, you're fastening things together. Uh, but we're going to start with power screws. So a power screw, I have a couple. Well, actually, I have one right here. And it would be something like this. So I don't know if we can get out far enough to see it. This is a, a scissor jack. And this guy in here is working as a power screw. Um, sometimes they're called power screws. Sometimes they're called lead screws. Uh, they, they're exactly the same. The difference is what it's used for. So typically a lead screw is for moving a piece of uh, machinery relative to the rest of the machinery. So you would think maybe um, maybe on a lathe, you have the, the screw along the bottom there that you can move the carriage back and forth with. That one you'd probably call a lead screw, whereas this case, um, the intent is you're still moving over on the other end here. You're still moving this nut back and well, the nuts inside there, but you're moving it back and forth. But the intent is that you're lifting something up. So uh, they work all the same. There's no difference in uh, the, the way they work other than power screw typically means you're lifting or moving some heavy thing. Lead screw usually is a piece of machinery uh, where you're moving one thing like the carriage on a lathe back and forth um, without really moving a lot of mass, but they work the same. Um, they are a little different. So they are a little different from what typical screws, mm -hmm. typically. They, they don't have to be, but there are, um, they have different thread profiles. And I'll see if I can get in on this close enough you can see this one. I'll have to see if I can focus on it. Um, oh, that's good. Well, kind of good. Let's see if we can, there we go. All right, so I think you can make out that. Um, if you look really close, the thread profiles here are uh, not your typical thread profile. So I have a bolt here. Let's see if we can see it. It's going to get washed out a little bit. Um, and it's not just that the threads on here are smaller than the threads on here. Uh, the actual shapes of these threads are different from this. So this one um, in the scissor jack, uh, if you can look at it close, um, it is actually a square profile. That one you might can see. Yeah, you can kind of see the outlines uh, right there are pretty square looking. Um, so these are harder to make. You know, you have it's harder to actually make a square thread around a, you know, it's basically a helix around this root, uh, solid root in the middle. It's harder to make that than it is to make something like one of these guys where uh, they're actual triangular shapes. They're not the, the top, triangles with the tops cut off. Um, there is another uh, profile that's common for these lead power screws that's called an acne thread. Um, it does look a little bit more like these. Um, we'll have to show up. I don't have an example of that here, um, but we'll look at a picture of the thread profile for that. Um, so let's get this out of the way and look at some thread profiles in here. Oops. Oh, well, got to get less saturated. So here, this is a thread profile for a more uh, regular bolt that you might have. So you can kind of see where it would have been a triangle, but the very tips of the uh, screw thread are a lot of times not there. Um, an acne thread is similar to that. Here there's a small picture down here. 
So there's the square square thread, that one that we just looked at on the scissor, scissor jack, and it has little squares on it. Harder to make um, just because of trying to turn this shape on a lathe and create that in a helix. This one is the Acme, so a little bit easier to make than the square thread, and it looks similar to the traditional um, screw thread, like would be on one of these guys, um, except you got a little bit larger root diameter, uh, a thicker top over here, and a set angle here, 29 degrees. Um, so that if it's Acme, then this angle between the faces of a joint or neck to one another teeth, adjacent teeth, um, is set at 29 degrees. Um, these diagrams are going to be helpful. This is a figure 8-3 on page 405. Um, they have a lot of dimensions listed there. These dimensions end up uh, showing up in equations that you're going to use to figure out how uh, these thread profiles perform. Um, and those equations are probably in the following pages. Let's see if I can... Yeah, on page 408 has most of the equations that you're going to end up using. Um, they do have a good derivation of how these equations are figured out in the book. We're not going to go through that. Um, it's actually relatively easy to follow. Um, and it does kind of give you a little bit more insight on what's happening. But uh, we're just going to use just the equations that they actually derive. Um, okay, let's look at what this might do. So, let's go over here. Oh, let me tell you a few more um, differences here, or one versus the other type of thing. Acme versus square thread. Those are the two common uh, lead screw profiles. So, Acme... That's the one that has the little bit pyramid looking threads on it. Um, so this one, uh, it is easier to make than the square. Where the square you have to go in and cut these square profiles, but not just square profiles, they're square helixes. And so that's, that's pretty hard to make. Um, so these typically do cost a little more. Um, there are reasons why you um, sometimes would want a square versus an Acme. So for one thing, the Acme thread, since it is at an angle here, is going to create a little bit of a wedging action. When it is in use, so that's going to create uh, higher friction forces, higher frictional forces given the same materials and sizes and all that uh, of a square thread. So in other words, they have a little bit more power loss. Um, these sharp corners down here are harder to make, which means more expensive. But it also, there's a little stress concentration at these corners. Uh, that is, there is a stress concentration here too, but uh, there's more stress concentration on these guys. So there is that to deal with. Um, those are probably a couple of the different uh, details. So in your book, they give you the, the main equations for, they give it for square. Um, TR, there's one called TR and one called TL, and these are uh, equations 8, 1, and 8, 2. This is the torque to raise. Now, you're not always raising something, um, so but they do leave that uh, name, torque to raise, torque to lower for the L. Um, what raise means if you're not literally raising something off in the air, then it just means that you are um, opposing whatever direction, whatever force, maybe you're moving something in the, the, and there's opposition to it being moved, so that would be count as raising. Um, sometimes you literally are lifting something straight up or at an angle upwards or whatever, so it is raising. Um, typically, 
raising is uh, gonna take more torque than lowering. I mean, there could be situations where that, maybe there's some situation where that's not true. Um, but uh, typically, more torque is required to raise, whether you're moving a heavy thing or something that you have to push against to move it, um, or you're lifting it up and gravity is your opposition. Uh, the Acme thread, they only give you TR. And it is equation 8.5. So the torque to raise for Acme is given. The torque to lower is not. So basically what you do to figure out the torque to lower is you use 8.2. But uh, you'll notice the difference in these equations. Let's look at them real quick. They're in here. So here's the torque to lower for um, a square thread, equation 8.2. Um, and see all these terms, F, D, and we'll have to see what all that means. But uh, all these terms. And then over here, here, actually, maybe let's look at the torque to raise. So look at both of them, torque to raise, torque to lower. These are square thread, very similar with the differences being plus and minus and minus and plus. And they've, uh, that's basically, they've rearranged here. They're basically the, the lead L here became a negative in the numerator and the friction times the lead became a positive here where it was a negative. Over here is torque to raise. This is equation A5 torque to raise for a Acme thread, same format, except that there's this secant alpha in here. So one over cosine is secant. Um, this is to take into account the fact that the Acme thread is not, you know, uh, perfectly straight squares. It does have that slope on the thread. And so that's where that secant alpha is coming from. So to figure out torque to lower, you basically take this exam, same equation and flip the plus and minus like you did over here. So we'll do that or we'll write that down later on. But the, just if you're looking for a torque to lower equation for an acne thread, it, there's not one in the book. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, all right, so a couple of these terms in here. Let's go in and look at, uh, let's, We'll look at the Acme thread because it is the one that is more common than the square thread. Um, so we'll look at it. All right. So this is equation uh, 8.5. Torque to raise for an Acme thread. All right. So something like that. Um, and then equation 8.5 on page 409, torque to raise equals, and then here's all of this, all these terms that so we got to figure out what they mean. Okay, <clears throat> so TR, that's torque to raise. We got that one. So that's how much torque you have to apply to the shaft to raise the uh, nut that is riding up and down on the thing. Um, and that nut's either attached to, you know, some piece of machine like the scissor jack, or maybe it's um, the split nut on the uh, lathe where it uh, is attached to the carriage, moving the carriage back and forth, whatever it is. Um, so that's how much torque you have to input to make the thing move in one direction. Um, and then there would be the torque to lower, which would move it in the other direction. F, so F is the force that you're having to oppose. Uh, so what, you know, if the, if you're lifting a, a weight, then it's the weight of the thing in pounds or newtons but it's the force that you're having to oppose to, to move. 
dm. So this is the mean diameter. So this would be something where um, we have to look at the thread profiles and uh, we do have, this would be on page, let's see if I can find a good one. Maybe that shows that. Maybe there's not one that shows it. I don't see one right now that shows that very easily, but this is the mean diameter. So if we look at a, um, an Acme, this is an Acme thread, so it would be the same if we were dealing with another type of thread, but we'll look at the Acme one. So so there's, and here's a center line. So there'd be the other half over here somewhere. We're only going to measure from this center line because I'm running out of page. Um, so the let's kind of let's do this so there's what we're dealing with from the center line to here uh well actually i guess if let's all the way down to the other side this would be d r so that's the root diameter so if we measured to here it'd be the radius so we have to go all the way to the other side so the root is usually what you're thinking of as the solid part basically the solid rod in the thread so the threads are on top of that root um, so the root diameter um, if we measured to the very peak up here all the way to the peak on the bottom side uh, a lot of times that one's just going to be labeled D, so it's the diameter. Uh, this is the number that uh, you describe the Acme thread with, so it's a three-quarter inch Acme thread. It's measuring if, as if you measured from the peak of one crest all the way down to the opposite peak. Uh, now, there's not one directly opposite this because they're offset because it's a helix, um, but that outer diameter basically. And they just usually use D for outer diameter or crest diameter or whatever you want to call it. Um, the mean diameter is right in the middle of those. So it really is the average of the outer diameter and the root diameter would be the mean diameter. So it's an average. Um, and you can calculate it that way. You can calculate it as, uh, I think your book might have some equations that calculates it using uh, this little dimension right here, which is uh, P, well, not that dimension, this dimension, P over 2. Uh, I think it has an equation that uses uh, P over 2, which is the distance between the root and the top of the thread. Um, so there's different ways. It's just the average of the outer diameter and the root diameter. Okay. Um, so that's the mean diameter, that new term. Two is two. L. This one is called lead. So lead is how far does the nut that's riding on these threads, how far does it move every time the power screw turns one complete revolution? So how far the nut moves with one revolution of screw. Um, and you literally can measure that. A lot of times, not all the time, but many times, it is the same as the distance between here. So if I picked out uh, similar features on two adjacent threads, uh, that may be the lead. Uh, this is actually called P. Uh, P does not show up in this equation, but it's something that gets used a lot. So P is pitch. And um, 
when pitch and lead are the same, what that means is that there is a single thread wrapped around this group. It is possible, and you, you might can imagine this. Let's see if we can go over here and kind of show this. It is possible that, uh, let's say we have, this is our root right here. And then I have to get close to this. All right, so there's our root of a screw. And then maybe we have one thread that wraps around like this. So there's one thread. You can actually interlace another thread. In between there um, if you do that it's hard to see you know you can you can look at the threads on on a bolt or whatever well usually a bolt doesn't have uh, interlaced threads like this but a power screw or a lead screw relatively often does um, so uh, you can't really tell them apart they all have to look the same because they have to interface with the same nut um, but uh, it can be that there are multiple threads. Uh, typical, there's either a single thread, so single start is what that a lot of times is called. Um, and that, that's when lead and pitch are the same thing. Um, so remember, pitch is the distance between adjacent points on a thread profile, uh, on two adjacent thread profiles. Um, so if you have a single start, then lead and pitch are the same thing. If you have what we have here, so this is one thread. Double start is what we drew. Uh, there's actually two different threads. And then, left off a D there. Um, double start would be like this, where there's the, the black thread and the red thread. Um, there is even a quad start. And there would be four threads on that all interlaced together. Um, and so when you have double start like this, the pitch, you would still measure the same way where you find two adjacent, um, two adjacent features on, or two similar features on adjacent threads and measure the distance between them. Pitch would not change, but if you had double start, then lead would be twice as much because it would actually travel twice as fast, but the same pitch. So lead is not always pitch. If you did quad start, there's four of these threads all wrapped together, um, and lead would be four times pitch. So you do have to know, is it a single start, double start, quad start uh, thread profile to figure out what lead is. So lead on a single start is the same as pitch, uh, but if it's double start, it's twice pitch. If it's quad start, then it's four times the pitch, and that's gonna show up in L and L, so that's lead. Um, we have DMF. That's the coefficient of friction between whatever the uh, thread is made of and the nut is made of. They may be the same materials, they may be different materials. Um, that for what we're going to do, you do have a little chart in your book. Let's see if we can find it quick. Uh, in the chapter, not at the back of the book. Here it is. Oh no, that's, that's not it. Here we go. All right. So you have coefficients of friction 
for threaded pairs. And this thing over here with the thrust collar, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, but this would be, you've got what is the nut made of and what is the screw made of. And you've got a little matrix here of ranges of coefficients of friction. Um, so there might be um, a reason to pick one of these numbers over another. You know, like for a bronze nut on a steel screw, you've got a range of 0.15 to 0.23. So um, in a problem that I'm asking you to solve, I would give you indications on which end of that range to pick. Most of the time, you're going to pick the more conservative end of the range. So in this case, more conservative would be a, a larger number, more friction. Um, now, if you're, there might be a reason to pick another number, or another number in that range, um, and then and I'd just have to tell you, pick the average, pick the lower end, the higher end, whatever. Um, or you're given the coefficient of friction. Um, alpha is the only other thing here, well, secant of alpha. Uh, and so you do have a little diagram that shows, let's see, right here, um, this angle, is given as 29 degrees for an Acme thread. I'm trying to find the page numbers. All right. So this whole angle for an Acme thread is 29 degrees. Um, on page 409, figure 87, you have a little picture of a uh, Acme thread. Now it's turned sideways. And they define, that's where they define alpha. And so they go in and say, this guy is two times alpha and it's called the thread angle. So um, this, this 29 degrees over here is actually two alpha. So alpha is 14 and a half, half of 29. Um, so you do have to make sure that you don't just put 29 in, in for the secant alpha. Uh, it is half of 29. Um, so once you know all of those, that would let you fill in all of the things. You have the force, the mean diameter, the lead, <coughs> pi is in there a couple of times, um, friction between the nut and the screw, and then the angle of the screw thread. This part doesn't show up on the square threads because there, there is no angle, they're parallel. Um, and you could, what this would calculate is the torque to raise, but it's not all of the torque to raise because typically there is a feature like this right here. Um, if you're raising something, then you've got to be holding somewhere. You got to push against something somewhere else. And so this collar um, is riding on some surface, um, usually on the other end of the... Uh, power screw. Um, I don't have a good way to see it here, but on the jack, you know, there's a little block back here that the power screw rides against. And, um, and on the power screw, there is a collar that keeps it from just going through the whatever it's riding against. Um, and so this collar is usually part of the it's machined into the power screw. Maybe sometimes it's uh, an attachment to it, but a lot of times it's just machined into it. Um, and so since this collar rides against some stationary surface, there's friction between those two surfaces. Um, so when you're calculating torque to raise, you have to have this component, which is just between the nut and the screw. And then plus you have to add in the uh, collar friction. Collar friction, is F, F, we're gonna put a C on this one. This is another friction, but it's between the collar and whatever it's riding against. Um, DC, we'll have to explain that one, and uh, over two. So DC, right here, um, you can see DC is not the diameter of the collar. So the collar is, you know, the the, has some larger diameter, DC is the average between where the collar actually makes contact. So it is um, 
whatever the midpoint between here and here is. So that's how you calculate diameter of the collar. It's diameter of, it's kind of like the mean diameter for the screw. Um, it's the same type of thing for this collar diameter. It's not literally the outside of the collar. You do go into the midpoint of this contact and measure from there to the other side to get the DC. Um, and like I said, this friction is not necessarily the same as this friction because it is uh, the friction that the collar between whatever it's riding on, uh, whereas the this one is the friction between the screw and the nut. Um, and there was a chart, that same chart had, um, well not the same chart, but the chart right beneath it had uh, collar frictions. So there's one for running, one for starting. Um, so that's just, are you stationary before you apply this torque? So you're trying to figure out um, the torque needed to actually get the thing started moving, then it's starting. Are you already moving? You know, like you've overcome that initial friction and now it's just running, then it drops down a little bit. So the starting friction is higher than the running friction. Um, once you know all of those things, then it's just a matter of plugging the relative numbers into these equations and um, solving for uh, the the torque to raise or the torque to lower. Sometimes you want to know power. Um, and if you remember power, uh, this one equals torque times how fast you're spinning in this case. So some, if, once you get your torque, total torque with collar friction, nut screw friction, all of that added together, uh, then you can add, uh, multiply by how fast you want this thing to spin and figure out how much power, so horsepower to turn the thing, what size motor do you need to turn the screw or whatever. Um, you can size it that way. Um, like I said, torque to lower, very similar, except that um, you flip these signs on the Acme thread. They don't give you an actual equation for that. Um, if the torque to lower is not a positive number or if it's zero, um, that means that it is uh, the threads, so the threads on your screw are so steep, you know, they're really steep threads, that if you set the screw down and put the nut on there, then it would just spin itself down just from gravity, the, the weight of whatever's on top of the thing. Um, so torque to lower can be zero or negative. If that's the case, then it is not self-locking. So if torque to lower is greater than zero, then it's called self-locking. You have to put torque into the system in order to lower the um, mass or whatever it is you're lowering. Normally you do want, particularly if it's like a jack or something like that, you do want the torque to lower to be greater than zero. You wanna to have to add some amount of torque. Um, it will be less than the torque to raise, uh, but if the torque to lower is not greater than zero, then it will lower itself because uh, it, it doesn't need you to input torque to lower it. Um, so you do want to um, typically have torque to lower greater than zero uh, so that your system is self-locking and it, it stays in place until you add some amount of torque to get uh, the thing to lower. Um, let's see, I think that might cover all of the terms there is uh the idea just so we have it that um and I, this, this would probably show up more in a uh, homework problem but efficiency um the, just use if you're asked to calculate the efficiency of one of these systems then just think of efficiency as not an equation that you're going to solve necessarily that has a specific set of variables in it, but think of it as the useful power out. So you moved a nut and lifted a weight a certain amount or whatever. So you did some power or you put power into that um, and divide that by the required power in. 
So you did, um, you know, you calculate the torque, calculate the torque to raise, um, and then maybe you figured out how much power that was associated with because you knew the torque to raise times the uh, amount of uh, how fast you were turning the shaft, how fast you were raising the uh, load, and you can figure out the efficiency of the system. I think there might be some web work problems that have you calculate efficiency. Um, that's why I point that out. I don't know if there's too many of them, but just so you know, there's not going to be a specific equation, whatever, that says efficiency is and it's going to have variables in it. You're going to have to think of it as uh, power out over power in. Um, okay, I think that gets us through lead screw definition. Um, if you have questions about uh, how the lead screws work, or there is, I think, homework three on web work has power screw problems in it. Um, or maybe I haven't put the power screw problems up yet. I'll, I'll put them up soon. Um, typically, I'm trying to give you about 10 days, a week to 10 days to do a web work problem from the time that we start it. Um, they are typically kind of lengthy. So uh, if there's not already a power screw problem up there, I'll put one up uh, soon. And then uh, let me know if you have questions. I think we should be good for today. All right, thank you.